I want to model that for other people. I want to connect other people because me as a manager, I only know this much. Uh, but if I can connect you to someone else in a different department, they might know this much and, and be able to help you. Welcome to another episode of Leading to Fulfillment podcast, where everything we talk about is meant to encourage people-first leaders, empower individuals to achieve fulfillment, and help your organizations become places people love to work. I'm your host, James Laws, and my guest today is Patrick Rowland. Patrick has been a product manager, a product marketing manager, an e-commerce consultant, and currently he is the brand manager for the fantastic membership solution for WordPress called Paid Memberships Pro. In my conversation with Patrick, we discuss fulfillment through progress and the circle's fulfillment model, how leadership can impact team fulfillment, the fears and triumphs of transitioning to a new leadership role, encouraging and navigating healthy work-life integration, and the power of good one-on-ones. If you enjoy this episode, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the Leading to Fulfillment podcast in your favorite podcast tool. We're on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and everywhere else podcasts can be found. And if not, let me know so I can correct that. Also, don't forget to check out circles.com. Again, that's circles with two eyes, And subscribe to our newsletter. There, we'll let you know when each new episode drops, as well as send you original curated content on leadership, managing teams, and finding fulfillment. Another way you can help us promote the show is simply by giving us a review wherever you like to listen to the show. And now, here's my conversation with Patrick Rowland. Well, hello and welcome to Leading to Fulfillment. My guest with me today, Patrick Rowland. Uh, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for joining me on this uh, new show that we're doing. Thank you for having me. I'm, I always love chatting with you. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, you reached out to me on Twitter. I've been talking a little bit about the show as we're leading up and we said, Hey, you're in this kind of transition in this new phase of leadership in your own life. It'd be an interesting conversation. And in a way, I think what's interesting to me is, uh, this show is made for you. Uh, it's made for people just like you who are maybe either transitioning into leadership or wanting to do leadership in a different way. And hopefully conversation that we have and the other conversations that I'm, I've been having will be great fodder for that. But to get started, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? I gave a little bit of an intro, but you're going to do much better because I just gave the high level view. Mm-hmm. Who is Patrick Rowland? Oh boy. Uh, so Patrick Rowland, uh, right now today, I work for a great company. I'm the brand manager at Paid Memberships Pro. Uh, so they're a great WordPress uh, membership platform company. And um, in addition to that, I've done a lot of other stuff in the WordPress space. So I've worked at a company called Nexus. I was a product marketing manager. I've worked at a company called WooThemes. Uh, I was the product manager for uh, WooCommerce. I've created a whole bunch of courses for LinkedIn Learning uh, or lynda.com. Um, and then in addition to all that, I've also d- you know designed board games and I uh, run a board game podcast. So if you want to learn about board game design, you know I have a podcast on that. Uh, And I do all sorts of other nerdy stuff, but I love technology, WordPress, and I love helping small businesses get started. So that's what a lot of my focus is around at work is helping people run their own business. That's very cool. And so in in that transition, you've gone from doing your own stuff to working, you know, under the leadership of others. And now you're in this kind of transition space where you're leading a small team of your own. Before we get into all the leadership stuff, I know you have a lot of interests and a variety of hobbies and stuff like that. But between all of that, how do you describe fulfillment for you? Because at the end of this, at the end of all of this, the whole point of this show is to help leaders want to achieve fulfillment for themselves and to help their teams find fulfillment. In order to do that, you kind of have to have a perspective of what you think fulfillment ultimately means. What does fulfillment ultimately mean to you? Uh, both as a as a team member and as a leader. Hmm. Um, well, in in life and in business, and I and I don't think the two are that different. Like I think you should have the same perspective in both. Um, I always try to challenge myself, so I I just want to get one step better every day. Um, and and just to bring in one of my personal hobbies, like I love painting these little nerdy miniatures. And I set a, I set a goal for the end of the year if I want to use these new techniques. You know, I wanted to like learn how to use like LEDs in my miniatures and all, all sorts of nerdy stuff. And uh, I just I just did it this other weekend, uh, and uh, the project actually failed. 
But I got to use these new techniques. And it, even though the project didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, I still learned a ton. And that for me is just always fulfilling. So now I, I already have, oh, cool. When I can redo the project next year, I, I, I'll do X, Y, and Z to make sure that it actually succeeds. So for me, fulfillment is all about setting a goal and trying to achieve it. Um, many, many years ago, I think it was over, gosh, I think it was over 10 years ago, I wanted to run a marathon. And, uh, you know, being um, overly confident in my abilities, I thought that because I walked to work and that was a three mile walk, so it was a, I would walk three miles there and walk three miles back at the end of the day. That's six miles a day, right? A marathon's only, you know, 24 or whatever it is, 26.1. Yeah, yeah. You know, how hard could it be to go from six to 26? And uh, I, d I got to mile 18 in my first try. And then, you know, and I gave up. Um, but then the next year, I did this thing called training. Uh, and then I got through it. Um, but I, I'm just a big fan of like setting goals. And as long as you learn something, I'm good. Like, I, I think that that for me is just always fulfilling of like taking a step, taking a step forward. That's it. You know, you, I think you and I are a lot alike in that regard. I, I define it this way, right? For me, uh, I feel my most fulfilled when I'm making progress and whatever it is, right? When I make progress and it doesn't have to be mind blowing progress, but that's why I liked running as well. Uh, running, I was able to measure so many little things. Could I run faster? Could I run farther? Could I pick up my pace? Could I go over longer distance? Uh, and it was all just, and it was all really just progress and competing against myself. And that, that drives me more than perhaps anything else. And are there other factors of fulfillment for me? Do I want to love the thing that I'm doing? Certainly. Uh, do I want to feel like it's a, that it, you know, believe that it has meaning and there's purpose behind it? 100%. But amazingly, all those things can almost be overshadowed as long as yeah. I'm making progress. I yeah. might be, uh, I did the, have you ever done Enneagram? Yep. Yeah, I'm a three. And I think that's where some of that, uh, any of my uh, progress uh -huh. comes from. <laughs> uh -huh. So three is, uh, so I'm tied for a three and a five. So I think five is like the thinker. And then the three mm -hmm. is like, Motive. I forgot like the motivator. The, I can't remember the, the achiever. <laughs> the achiever. Yeah. 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 So I, I get both of those. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. And, and I think, you know, for those, for those listening, right. If you're, if you're trying to figure out like what's fulfillment, I, I use this as a model. This is my model for thinking about in my fuf uh, fulfillment. I think about it for my team too. In fact, I actually pull our team we're, we now do this quarterly where we ask our team, these three statements, these three statements, we ask them to kind of rate themselves. It's that I love what I do. I believe what I do matters. And I see the impact that I have on what I do. And if you can score on the positive on all three of those, to me, that's how I know I'm fulfilled. Like that's, that's how I know I've really found fulfillment. And that's where like progress will take me a really long way. But even at some point, I still have to love it. And I have to believe that it matters. And if I don't believe any of those things, like eventually... And, and the thing is, is that doesn't mean it has to be this lofty, big thing. Like you love designing games and some people might say, well, how do you, do you believe that matters? Well, yeah, it can matter. You just have to figure out why it matters to you. And if it matters to you, then yes, it matters. And you can see your impact on, that you have on that. So I think you can see those, yeah. those come out. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, so just 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 uh, riffing on this uh, with designing games. So I made a little game. You can see it behind me. It's called Fry Thief, and you know I think I sold um, a couple, a, you know, a few hundred copies in the Kickstarter campaign, and I have a few hundred more that I'm going to sell at convention someday. And even though I've only sold a few hundred copies, and you can think well, that's a, a small impact on the world. For the last two years, whenever people are at a restaurant with their significant other and someone's stealing their fries, they'll send me a message on Twitter, on Facebook, on <laughs> on email. They'll text it to me of like them stealing fries from their significant other. Like they, it's this, it's this experience that they've they've had, and they know made a game about it, and it brings me joy. Like eighteen yeah. months after I made this game, people are still sending me pictures of of stealing fries. It's a it's a silly little thing, but it brings me a lot of joy and fulfillment that I I did a thing. That's, that's really awesome. And yeah, and, and you right. You see the impact. It actually has, has moved people to engage with you on something as silly as Fry Thief. I have really, I, I'm looking at it right now. It's sitting on a shelf 
that same game <laughs> sitting there. Uh, so yeah, that's that's really awesome. Um, let me ask you a question. Based on your your definition of fulfillment, and how you find fulfillment, which is not very far from how I I see it. Uh, how have previous leaders either helped you, like pushed you towards that, or hindered you in your own pursuit of fulfillment? Because I think there's something to be learned there from a leadership perspective on how we impact the fulfillment of the people that we're that we come in contact with, especially as leaders on a daily basis. Hmm. I, I th- hmm. Well, so I've had all sorts of different um, bosses and managers and inspirational people and in co- companies above me, um, and I think I think some of the best people will give me um, just enough guidance to get something to to give me to give me um, a goal to shoot for and like a very loose, rough path of how to get there. And I love that for me is great. Of like, you, you just want you want. Um, like a, you want a fat marker sketch, right? You want like, here's yeah. roughly the direction you want to go. Um, and then I've also had bosses that want very specific outputs and that's turned me off where they like, you know, so I, uh, my, my approach now, let me, let me start with what, what didn't work. Some yeah. will say, Patrick, we need to get 200 leads for Black Friday. Okay, uh, I can try that. And I, um, and you, some years you do great. Some years you don't. You don't make that based on the numbers and how they calculate them and blah blah blah. And I, I, I don't love that. I don't love this like outcome result focused thing. I would much rather like Patrick. We need to get all these leads for Black Friday. Let's write four blog posts and some social media stuff and some newsletter content. The output is easy to measure, and I can I can easily make sure I achieve that, and then I feel good. And then some, you know, sometimes your newsletter isn't as interesting as you wanted it to be. Um, sometimes I want to get like a hundred responses to a pot a board game podcast I put out, and sometimes I get two responses instead of a hundred. Um, I I you can't control that output, but you can control what you put in, and that's that's where I want to focus because then you then you can feel successful every day. Um, and when you feel successful every day, you start building momentum. And when you start building momentum, then you start getting, you start, good things start happening. Ideas are firing. People want to work with you. So I would rather, you know, put a blog post out every day, put a social media thing out every day, whatever it is, and just get momentum and keep moving forward. And I think I learned that by having some bosses who are always resu- like, we need to have $1,000 of sales today. Um, so sell that, Patrick. Ugh, I don't know how to do that, you know? <laughs> Well, that's you make a really good point too. In that, I I wonder if managers or leaders that you had worked with in the past would have been more effective if they would have said, "Hey, as an organization, we want to get two hundred more leads, two thousand more leads, or whatever the case may be." And they said, "What are the levers we can pull? Let's create a plan together. What do you think are some levers we can pull to make that possible? Can't guarantee it." But we can start to look for it because what we're really talking about in that conversation is the difference between leading and lagging measures. You know, when you're trying to get 2000 leads, when you when you got them, it's too late to do anything about it. Right. Like this, the work that got you those leads had already been done. It's the leading measure. The I wrote so many blog posts. I put out so many social posts and stuff that I that's a lever that you can pull and and do that. And it may not be the right lever. And that's where experimentation comes and working with team members to say, Hey, you're passionate about this. We have this goal. How do we, what are the levers we can pull to do this? Well, I think social posts and stuff, let's try it. And in two weeks, if we don't see something, we'll define different levers because those levers are obviously not the ones that are working. And that collaborative approach of saying, I'm not going to prescribe to you just a goal and then go do it. I'm going to say, yes, or as an organization, we have a goal, but now let's collaborate and you help me determine, you know, what levers you can pull to make that happen, I think is a, is a healthy approach. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, I really like that. Um, I was just looking at our analytics um, at paid memberships pro on like what content is the best because I've, I've been here for basically six months and I've tried a lot of stuff and I was shocked that I put out a news blog. Like it was like a, it was about like I think PayPal fee increase or PayPal fees are increasing. And it was just like a, hey, here's this like useful thing for you to know, membership site owners and operators. And it was the top post of the year. I had no idea 
when I was writing it that it would be that good. And if I wasn't experimenting, I wouldn't have known that. And I, I, I'm just a big fan of, let's just keep throwing a ton of stuff at the wall. We'll find what works best at the end of the year. We'll do some analysis and then we'll, we'll realize great. Now, now next year, we're definitely going to do two, maybe three articles that are similar to that. We'll try them again next year and see if it was just a fluke or if that's something that people actually really enjoy reading and engaging with. And maybe that's a, a viable strategy or maybe it was just uh, luck. Yeah. Hey, I, I am all for experimentation, you know, put something out there, try it out, measure it. If it works, try it again and see if you can keep it. I mean, it's the old, it's the old ad space, right? How much do you spend on ads as much as you can until you're not, you're getting less of a return than you're spending into it, right? Like that's, that's when, you know, you, when you hit that, that curve, you go, okay, we're done. Don't invest any more in ads because it doesn't work for us. And we can do that with almost anything. You test it until the returns become less than what you're investing into it. Cool. Well, tell me, so that's one of the things that you, you've you said leaders do have done poorly in the past, right? They've been very prescriptive and not collaborative in that process. What, what would you say is, if you could think of one leader who's really checked the box for you and impacted you in a positive way towards fulfillment? what might be their approach? Um, you know what? So um, my, I really enjoyed my time at Woo Themes. I had a boss, Matty Cohen. Uh, he's, st- he's still there, uh, I believe. I haven't checked in with him in a, a, a while, but I believe he's still there, still, still rocking. And he was very good about, um, I would identify problems of like, or, or potential problems. Hey, I think this is a problem. Here's this new approach. What do you think? Um, and he, he, so he gave me a lot of runway. Um, that's always helpful to give you space to do things. Um, and I think he also gave me, he also gave really good guidance, uh, both from, you know, he was the head of product at the, at the time. So he was, um, uh, gave me good product insight and he also did a good job connecting me. So I think, um, good leaders will know when to like connect you with different people in, in your industry or across, or so maybe in a different company, but in a similar role, or he will, uh, it, it, uh, connect me with someone else in the company in a totally different part of the company they didn't even know existed. I think he was very a very good connector and would help me uh, sketch out ideas before I even got started. So I think there's you know give you maybe give you a project and some um, flexibility of how to get it done, but then also make some connections for you that would have you know you can you can always <laughs> you can always uh, learn things your own, um, but also if someone can you know summarize it in a blog post or a, a lesson that you will eventually learn yourself if they can summarize that for you and say, hey, I learned this lesson a while ago. Let me give you some advice uh, and talk to X, Y, and Z and they will be able to help you. Um, that's magical and always helpful. Um, I, I personally think the way I usually learn is from mistakes, either by myself or from a friend telling me how they made a mistake. So if you can connect some, you know, Patrick to Warren and Warren can tell me a story about how he you know, broke the website and dropped web uh, revenue by 10% by doing X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh, wow, that's not good. I will make sure not to do that. Um, you know, I could still learn from other people's mistakes that way. Um, so that was, that was always helpful. And I, I also just love always having different perspectives on things. Um, there's, um, I think about this all the time. There's a, a great U- series on YouTube and it's a Ted talk called everything is a remix. Um, check it out. It's by Kirby Fer- Ferguson, I think is the author, um, creator. Okay. I'll try to post and, it in the uh, show notes. It's great. Uh, and one of the, one of the, the, I'll, I'll summarize it down to one sentence is we don't really have new ideas, but you can get new ideas by combining two different industries and two different approaches. So when you can combine, you know, a product person and a marketing person, you can, you can, you can create product market fit by p- p- putting those two fields disciplines together. Um, so I think that connection is just really important. And I, I want to model that for other people. I want to connect other people because me as a manager, I only know this much. Uh, but if I can connect you to someone else in a different department, they might know this much and, and be able to help you. Well, what's interesting there is, you know, that, that manager for you did what I try to teach our managers to do for their teams. And that is in that process of making connections What they're doing is they're removing the barriers and the blockers to your progress. They're basically, you're basically saying like, I'm stuck. I don't have this information. And so the good manager says, well, then I will find a way to help you get that information. 
and I will find the person, I will find the expert, I'll find the resource, I'll find the course, I'll do whatever I can to help you and make a lane. I, it's, to, I'm not a sports person, but to give the best sports analogy I possibly can is managers are like the offensive line and they're trying to make a lane or make the play for the quarterback or the tight end or the running back. They're trying to make a lane for that person. And so making those connections and making those things available to the team members to actually be, make progress and actually accomplish something. So I think that's that's an awesome thing that that manager did. And I think a great mm-hmm. example of what managers should be doing. That's really mm-hmm. cool. Yes. Um, I have no sports metaphors for you, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I shouldn't. I always get them wrong. And and my my business partners always make fun of me because I don't watch sports. I'm not a sports person. But I, I know just enough about sports uh-huh. to make a dangerous metaphor. Yes, me too. <laughs> so, um, uh, tell me. So now you've been transitioning, right? So we've talked about some previous managers you've had. And you've been transitioning into a leadership role. Uh-huh. And I'm curious – as you make that transition, which I'm, I'm assuming was a, a new experience for you, and, and it's still a new experience for you, what was your biggest fear making the transition from being a team member to being a team leader? Biggest fear. Well, yeah. So I, this is this is recent for me. So I, I joined uh, the, the team about six months ago. And what's very cool is I get to I got to uh, grow the team, right? Uh, there was one person, but he left shortly after for unrelated reasons. So basically starting fresh, I got to like grow my own team. Um, and I think my biggest fear is um, not having uh, integrity and like and not being um, not being someone that I want to follow. Does that make sense? And, yeah. and, you know, I, I've almost always had bosses and leaders who have high integrity and, and they will, they will do what they do, what they say. Um, but, you know, I want to be the type of person who, um, I want to get stuff done, but I also want to make sure that people have take time off. Um, and I want to make sure that people take sick days. And so here, here's an example. Uh, maybe it's just the pandemic, but I used to be, I used to be like a 8 a.m. into like 4 p.m. like type of person. I would work those hours and be done. And I've been working from home for seven, eight years. And so I'm used to that. And the pandemic messed that up. I don't know what it is, but like now I generally work like 8 a.m. until like 1 p.m. And then I take off in the afternoon and then I'll usually work an hour to the evening. And I just have to be like crystal clear with all the people on my team that like that is a choice I'm making and I'm taking time off in the afternoon. I do not expect people to work in the evening. I do not expect you to work on the weekends. Um, but I want to make sure that I have that high integrity. And so I will, I do all that I can to like, I will schedule email messages. I will schedule Slack messages. So even though I am working in weird time zones, I want to make sure that everyone else knows that like, I only expect you to work these times. I, you're allowed to have work-life balance or work-life integration. You're, I want you, I need you to have that to be your best selves. Uh, I didn't realize how much modeling I would have to do. That is not something I, I, I didn't think about. It, it takes more brain power than I thought it would to model that good behavior. Um, yeah. So I just want, I, I want to, I want to hold myself to a high standard. And I'm, I think my highest fear is that like, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to hold myself to the high standard of being elite, being someone that I want to work for. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's huge. And, and I feel that fear. Like I, I understand it. I, I think I, I battle with it on a, on the regular as well. I think, you know, I always have to remind myself that I fall short of my own values all the time, all the time. And they're my values. Like they're the things that I think are important. And yet I fall short on them all the time. And I think the one thing you can do there is model grace for yourself and for your team because uh, they're gonna also going to fall short of that. But I like I like that approach uh, of that kind of a flexible work schedule as well. It's something that I try to encourage the team on. Like I don't expect anyone on the team to work any specific hour. Like you work, life doesn't happen nine to five. Life doesn't only happen on the evenings and on the weekends. You know, things happen. My kid has something at school in the middle of the week and guess what? I want to go to it. And so I'm going to not be working during those hours. And I don't, I'm, so I don't, I don't, I don't really live by a set. And luckily I have the privilege uh, of working in an in industry and, and creating a company that allows ultimate flexibility and schedule. So if people want to work in the evenings, great. 
I, you know, it's funny because I usually say like, you know, don't make sure you don't log into that, into our team communication tool on the weekends. But the truth is I can't say that because if that Saturday is when they want to work, they should be allowed to do that. And if they want to take Monday off instead, I don't care. Like all we care about is, Hey, what are the goals we created together to achieve? And are we achieving them? And then it doesn't matter when you work. So I think that, and that is hard though. It's hard to emulate those things. I do the same thing. I think I talked about it on a previous episode, terrible at taking vacations. Uh, I'm actually on vacation right now and I'm recording this podcast. <laughs> like I am on vacation at this moment and I still can't get out of not doing a little bit of work. It's just the way I'm, I'm bad at it. Uh, and I always have to tell the team like, man, don't, don't do it the way I do it. I'm doing it wrong and I'm trying to be better. And I'm, and I always am making the conscious effort of being better at taking vacations, but I want everyone taking vacations. Right. So, so James, I will, I will ask you a question. I'm going to flip this on you. Right. So I, so not every hour is worth the same. Let me, let me start. That's my premise of this question. So okay. for me, the hours between like eight and 11 a.m., I get like twice as much done as any other hour in the day. Like I just, I'm just the most focused. I'm the most sharp. I'm the sharpest at that time of day. And so to me, and especially when I worked for myself and I had no bosses and I just made all these courses online, it makes more sense for me to work three hours a day, seven days a week and get more work done that way. And just, and then just take every afternoon off forever but that's like yeah. a and, and and I think that's and I, I think that's fine because it, it's actually maximizing my time. I can then cool, I can I'm gonna go play board games all afternoon. I'm gonna go play video games, I'm gonna go do whatever I'm gonna go on a I'm gonna go on a run, I'm gonna go walk three miles to work and pretend I'm uh preparing for a marathon. You know, um <laughs> I but I, I I but then people start working on the weekends and then people are like then they're checking their email Sunday night before work. That's my fear, is that yeah, if I yeah. if I allow this allow this if i if i model this and encourage this in a way that then they'll start working not only their regular work times but also an hour on saturday and an hour on sunday and that's not what i want so i don't know how to i think i have um i have self discipline i have some self discipline to only work 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. but not everyone else has that so i i just worry about that like i it's like yeah. a it's like a pandora's box and i worry if i open it then the mental health of my employees will just go tumbling downhill and we'll all be sad and depressed. I think that's a very real fear. And I think there's a real danger that should be, that should be a concern. I'm the same as you. Mine are like seven to 10 at seven to 10. I am the most productive. I'm creative. I have all, all my ideas come at that time. And I could literally work seven to 10, seven days a week and get more done than I could ever do working 60, 70 hours a week. Uh, and so I, I agree with, so the way I do that is I, I actually protect seven to 10 o'clock. I don't schedule meetings. I don't do anything but my most important work during those three hours. Then in the afternoons, if people need to schedule a meeting with me, that's when they can try to schedule a meeting because that's, that's time. I don't, I don't need to be creative for that. I don't like, I can, I can show up for those things. What I would say is the way you deal with that is I am a firm believer of weekly 30 minute one on ones with my team members. So I meet with them every single week. We talk for 30 minutes and it's all about them. It's their 30 minutes. And I'm looking for triggers. I'm looking for their health. I'm looking for how is life and how is their fulfillment. And if I get a sense that they're starting to head in the direction of working more than they're spent, you know, I believe in like living, a, like working around my life. So as things happen in my life, I'm like, well, that life, you know, life in general wins every single time. So I'm going to live this moment and I'll work around those schedules. But if I get a sense that that's getting flipped over on my team members, that's when you just have to have those tough conversations and say, tell me about it. Like, what are you feeling? And have those conversations. If you're having those weekly one-on-ones, you should be catching that before it gets too far. And then it's like anything we work on in projects iterative changes to redirect and to refocus uh, where that attention is. It's explaining what the value of a flexible work schedule is. It's not that you can work more. That's not why we have a flexible work schedule, not so you can work more. It's so that you can enjoy your life more. It's so you can be more fulfilled. It's so that you can work when you are the most creative and get the most done in a shorter period of time. Because the truth is, and I don't, I don't necessarily say this all the time, but all my, all my team members know it. 
I don't care if you work three hours or if you work eight hours, as long as we reached our objectives. I just don't care. <laughs> you know, when somebody says like, oh, you know, I didn't get as much work. I only worked a few hours today because I had a doctor's appointment. I'm like, okay, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I do not care as long as our objectives are met. So I think to your fear, uh, make sure as a manager, as a leader, that you are having those regular one-on-ones so you can, you're always got the pulse of your team and you can make those course corrections and just continue to espouse the actual value of flexible work, which is not about working more. It's about getting more done with less time and, and living the fullness of your life. So that's, that's how I would respond to that. Oof. Love that. I do. And you know what? I am happy. I've been setting up one-on-ones and that's, that is a pretty magical time. And I actually just got the first piece of like, can you please move this blocker for me, Patrick? Like, so I I feel like it took a couple, it took a couple months to get to that point where it was like, what's up? Nothing. (laughs) And, And you know, you're like, really is nothing up. Um, and I think it took a while, but I think we've gotten to that place of like, actually, Patrick, there is something that I would love for you to do and I'm taking steps to do it. So I'm, but I, I I guess I'm happy that I hear that one-on-ones is like one of the, the potential solutions because I've got that set up. Great. (laughs) It's a good one. And and it's up to the leader, right? To ask the right questions in those one-on-ones, pull that out of their team members. And there's really one magical question that you should be asking at the end of every single one-on-one. And that is simply what can I do to make your work experience better today? What can I do? And if, if nothing else, if you can get just an answer to that question, and for a while, if you're, if you're, if, if you're new to one-on-ones, you're going to experience exactly what you're experiencing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But if you're consistent, you can continue to, they're like, oh, he's serious about it. He really does want to help me. I guess I should try it. <laughs> Let's wrap up with this idea. What's been... In your previous, what, six months you've been doing this now? And what's been the most rewarding part you have taken away from the leadership experience? When you look at your role as a leader, what, what actually pulls you back and says, yeah, being a leader actually helps me towards my fulfillment. It is the most rewarding part of what I take out of it. Hmm. The most rewarding part. Um, so I think, um, so one of the things that's, so, uh, hired, hired two people, one of which is starting a couple of weeks. The other one's been, been here for a couple months. And one of the things that's very enjoyable is, is helping them solve their problems. So as an example, um, we just did this giant blog post analysis. We've gone through, we have 900 blog posts on our site. Um, and one of the people on my team, she did the grunt work of like pulling in all this data, analyzing all these posts. It was, uh, it was weeks and weeks and weeks of data. And what's cool is she had some questions about like, oh, well, can we do our blog posts like this? And I'm like, oh, well, did you know you can do that with some Excel magic? And so we set up some time. I was able to show, I, I think it felt like the act, the answers were in front of her and she didn't know it. You know, it's like, oh, you just need uh, this special UV light. Boop, there it is. Um, you know, there's a special tool you need or a special process you need or a special whatever and actually, all the answers are in front of you. Uh, and so that was actually a pretty cool um, experience of being able to like help people find the the stuff that they want. So to take it back to some of the other points we've been chatting about today, it, maybe it was nice that I've spent so many, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of hours in in Google Sheets that that knowledge is then also useful for someone else and not just for myself and my own my own stats, my own reporting. Um, that's been that's been really nice. Um, I, and then there's so many other things. And I think also being a, a, a leader, I'm realizing that over the last 10 years, I've learned a lot. Um, like there's, you know, I, I, there's skills of like visual and graphic design and there's skills in copywriting and writing headlines and, and how and what type of voice do we want for this post and wh- how do we want it to feel, which is like a very nebulous topic. Um but I've learned a lot and it's really fun and enjoyable to just share that with other people and to see how it interacts with their goals. Um, so like one, one person on my team really wants to like do all this social media stuff. I'm like, great, let's analyze all the social media. How do people find our site? Where do they come from? Do they hit our site and then social media? They go to social media, then our site, because that changes how we want to like send people back and forth. Uh, so it's just been really enjoyable to help people find, find whatever they want to do um, because the answers are there. You just have to know the right where to get the data and how to play with it to, to give you the, the insights you're looking for. 
For those who have been paying attention and listening to this episode, I think the, maybe one of the beautiful connections is here you are at the uh, end of, you know, starting your leadership career and, and pro, you know, professional experience. And the thing that you find rewarding is the thing a previous manager did for you, which was make connections, remove the blockers, get them to their their final destination. And I think ultimately that's what we as leaders do. And I think that's kind of beautiful that you you found yourself finding the most joy and fulfillment in the very thing somebody you respected did for you. Mm. Uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't put two and two together. Thank you for putting two and two together for me. It's nice. <laughs> it's awesome. Awesome, Patrick. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I am. I'm excited to see the journey of where this podcast goes and and the kinds of conversations that we get to have. I hope everyone enjoyed it. But thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and being on leading to fulfillment. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, James. I loved it. All right. We'll talk soon. I want to thank Patrick for being on the show with me and flipping the script and throwing a question back at me. I really enjoyed our conversation. As always, everything we mentioned, including the full transcript of the show, is available over on our website, and you can access it anytime by visiting leadingtofulfillment.com slash 004. The common thread that you can see all throughout my conversation with Patrick is just how much past leaders have had an impact on him and the kind of leader he wants to be moving forward. For better or worse, leaders impact not just their own organizations, but many others as well. They have an impact right now and usually for many years into the future. Not only because of their decisions as leaders, but because of what they impart on the leaders that follow after them. The danger for new leaders is to allow fear of getting it wrong or living up to the role stop them from making progress. You're going to fail. And that's all right. Instead of being afraid of it, look at it as an opportunity to demonstrate how to fail effectively by being transparent and learning something new from the experience. As a leader, our job is not to prevent failure. We are not the last bastion before the collapse. We are a guide on a journey with many obstacles. We may tell them to watch their step or to be on the lookout for various dangers, but we don't make the path easy. The hazards remain. Many have taken this adventure, some with a guide and some without, but we all fall down. We all feel the sting of failure and some more than others. These failures don't destroy us. They hurt for a period of time and some form scars or some more permanent souvenirs, but we get up. As a leader, our job is to help others along this journey. We don't prevent the fall. We help them get up. We help them learn everything they possibly can through the failures. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me on the next episode of Leading to Fulfillment. Mm-hmm.